We're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, kind of had a, a last minute change. Um, we had uh, Mrs. Uh, Susan Tierney uh, came down with an illness and is unable to be here today. So in her place, uh, we have uh, Don Paul, and he will be uh, quite um, informative and very, uh, he will lead the, lead the charge here. So anyway, we'll let him introduce the, the rest of the panelists, and we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you. Well, good afternoon, and uh, is everything on? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I appreciate people coming. It's always uh, a challenge sometimes, the last uh, session of a, of a very large and exciting conference like this one. Uh, I'm going to let each of the panelists, as we go down the line, uh, introduce themselves and, and uh, give a few key remarks in short order. Uh, I would just say um, one or two things to start with, talking about the session on making the most of the natural gas boom in the U.S. Uh, probably many in this audience is, are quite knowledgeable, but uh, the U.S. is a couple of special things about the U.S. It's the world's largest gas producer today. Um, in fact, the U.S. along with Canada produce about 25 percent of the world's gas production. So uh, a huge resource base all of a sudden has been uh, uh, is beginning to be developed. So we're going to hear a lot of discussions um, about that. And uh, we'll get in some, I think, some provocative uh, questions from uh, the panelists to each other, as well as uh, an extended period to have questions from the audience. So I'm Don Paul. I'm a professor at the University of Southern California. In my first life, I had 33 years with uh, Chevron Corporation. Uh, I retired in June 08 as the chief technology officer. Uh, and in fact, at one point in time, I was the CEO of Chevron in Canada, so that was my problem at first uh, large scale introduction to both the, uh, uh, not that's just the production of gas, but the politics uh, and business of natural gas production. So, with that, I'll move down with uh, the line of my co panelists. Go ahead. Uh, do you want to just introduce yourself? Introduce okay. yourself and give your background. Okay. Uh, I'm Bob Secuta. I'm Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State um, in charge of Energy Affairs at the State Department. Uh, afternoon. I'm Russ Ford. I'm with uh, Shell uh, on the upstream side, produce oil and gas. I've been with the company for 30 years. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Hanger. I am a special counsel at a law firm called Eckert, and S Eckert Siemens. I'm uh, based in Harrisburg, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I also was the, uh, uh, formerly the secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection and uh, commissioner of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission. Good afternoon. My name is John Deutsch. I'm an institute professor at MIT. Why don't you go ahead? Let's uh, just go ahead and make our comments and remarks. Start? Um, yeah, I, I'll get started. I think in a way I may start this a little bit differently because we're talking about what's the sort of the, uh, the, the role for natural gas in the United States. I'm going to come at this a little differently because I'm going to talk about it internationally. Um, what we've seen in the United States, of course, is this tremendous boom in the availability of natural gas. Um, this has come about... Obviously, we, we look at these numbers and talk about the U.S. being self-sufficient now in natural gas by 2035. We're looking now at the idea of exporting rather than importing natural gas. This came about, um, I think, an important point for this conference and because of technology and because of the applications of technology. What we're seeing is how does this technology transfer overseas? How, what is the interest internationally in terms of natural gas? and in capturing the benefits of what we've developed here in the United States. How can this be transferred? A couple points on this. One is we, of course, see tremendous growth in the demand for energy, energy period, internationally. China, India, of course, also developing countries, the emerging market countries. Uh, right now, there's 1.3 billion people out there without access to energy. Uh, 2.7 people who have no sort of healthy way to cook their food. 2.7 billion people who have no healthy way to cook their food. These are massive numbers. These need to be. These are needs that need to be met. How do we do that? We can use the traditional technologies, but we can also see in the interest in the new technologies in terms of gas in general and the unconventional gas. Uh, what we are seeing right now in terms of engagement with foreign governments is tremendous interest on the parts of places obviously like China and India, but also in Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Poland, for example, the Baltic states, 
um, in developing unconventional gas. India has come to us too for what help we can, we can offer. How are we doing this? This is not going to be done in the sense of, of assistance type programs for a number of different reasons. But one of the chief ones, I think, is when we look at the development of unconventional natural gas in the United States, all the external factors that are involved in the development of that product. As we know, I mean, this is technology that needs to be done and needs to be done right. Um, the concerns in terms of the environment, concerns which people raise in regarding the seismics, which concerns about water, um, all of these things come into the equation. And we bring people actually over to the United States um, on various programs, senior officials from different countries, to talk about what it is we're doing. We have them come to Washington for a while, we have them talk to DOE, talk to various agencies, but we also get them out to the field, have them talk to NGOs, have them talk to local governments, have them talk to people who don't like unconventional gas as well as people who do, so they can sort of be making these, these uh, decisions. What we are finding, however, is great interest and desire to move ahead. This is something which I think, think is only going to be um, increasing. We look at the tremendous amounts of money which are actually being talked about right now um, regarding investments in, um, in, in natural gas. And I can actually just look at my own notes here. Um, under the International Energy Agency's scenarios, they're talking about cumulative investment of $9.5 trillion in 2010 dollars between now and, and uh, 2035 in terms of developing natural gas. Huge amounts of that, about $1 trillion going for development of, of unconventional natural gas. Infrastructure, things like that that need to be taken into account. One other thing that I think we need to think about, and we talked a little bit about this before, when we look at this on a global basis, there's a number of factors that came together for the United States in developing the natural gas here and the unconventional natural gas here. Those same factors don't necessarily exist overseas. And in some cases, we can help those governments pull things together, take steps that they can make the infrastructure, not just physical infrastructure, but investment infrastructure, legal infrastructure, regulatory infrastructure, get that in place to help those countries develop that. I think I would cut there. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I mentioned that I, that I do work for Shell. Um, probably most people think of Shell as a company that, that operates our gas stations, and it's probably easy to think to see why. We have 14,000 of them in the United States, but I'm not in that end of the business. I'm in the oil and gas producing end of the business, and I've got the privilege of leading uh, our onshore operation in, in North America. And in that capacity, uh, uh, me and my colleagues are, are very uh, in tune with and, and a big part of um, this whole gas question because we operate the shale plays, and the shale plays are really the reason why um, uh, we can say, and Don was able to note, that uh, the United States has overtaken, the, has the mantle now as the biggest gas producer in the world. We recaptured that or surpassed Russia a couple of years ago. Um, in the business I have right now, and this is big business, we've got the capability and the capacity to in invest somewhere between $3 billion and $5 billion per year for, for a number of years going forward. So it's big business, and that's just one company. We're not the only player in here, so when you multiply that by the number of companies that can play in this arena, it's really a, it's really a, huge, um, a, a huge business that we've opened up. But you often ask the question, is, is this real or is it just a bubble? Uh, if, if you're a power producer or somebody that's talking about making a big investment that's reliant upon natural natural gas, is it really going to be there for the long haul? And I think the answer to that is, is yes, it is. If, if you look at the backdrop that, that we're producing against right now, uh, ten years ago there wasn't hardly anything coming out of the shale gas reservoirs. The first was the Barnett. Now 30 percent of our gas supply is, 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 is in essence sourced by these shale gas reservoirs, the reservoirs that have been the real incentive for the growth. Um, and it's a portfolio of reservoirs. It isn't just one place. Ten years ago the Barnett was the first one. It became the biggest. It still is a big a big, uh, big producing area right around Fort Worth. It was eclipsed two years ago by the Haynesville Shale in northwest Louisiana, and that will be eclipsed at some point in time by the Marcellus in Pennsylvania. And there's a number, number of other shale plays in, in the United States and in Canada that can kind of fill in uh, the production function as well. So it's a portfolio of opportunities, not just a single one. You've heard of a 100-year supply. I think that's accurate. The question that should be asked, though, a 100-year supply at what price? I think even if you're in the, a $4 
per MCF range, which is, you know, pretty reasonable range based on historical standards. There's hundreds of TCF that can be developed. So um, I don't think this is a bubble. I think it's here to stay. I think it's a boom, and I think we plan our business accordingly because it does create business opportunities. It certainly creates business opportunities for the oil and gas industry. There's no doubt about that. I've, as I said, I've, I've been here for 30 years. It wasn't just an interesting stat. I wanted to couple that with the observation that this is probably one of the most significant things I've seen happen in the energy uh, world in my whole time, uh, my whole career in the energy business. The advent, uh, the advent of shale gas and the opportunity to develop it. You only get a chance a couple times to look at this even in a 30-year career, and it's really fantastic. Um, it creates business opportunities, and for many companies, it creates technology opportunities. Uh, these, these resources are durable. They're going to be around for a long time, and we will figure out how to get them out of the ground more efficiently. For example, right now, we have an operation in northwest Louisiana in the Haynesville that I mentioned uh, a minute ago. And we have uh, geologists and uh, uh, drillers who sit in Houston and actually feed real-time data back to the rigs in northwest Louisiana just to be able to cut down on the communication time so they can watch the drill bit as it goes through a form and make adjustments uh, based on what they're following in the strata beneath the earth. Um, great business opportunities for us, but the opportunities don't end with just the oil and gas business. There's a whole economy that revolves around this. Um, there's, there's estimates that say that right now the, the shale gas industry has been responsible for some, is responsible for 600,000 jobs, and I believe that. It's not just people who are on the drilling rigs or, or operate equipment uh, in the field. It's also people who run restaurants and hotels and all the the other services that provide and supply the oil and gas business. There's a statistic that says that by the next 20 years, so not too far on time horizon in the future, just the tax revenue and the royalty income that will be available from uh, the gas plays in North America will reach over $900 billion, almost a trillion dollars. So this is big business no matter what way you cut it. You know those numbers are wrong because they're forecast, but it's still, they're still big numbers and it's going to be, it's going to be um, a real factor in the economy. And it's going to be a real factor in more uh, in an interesting part of the economy. I was born in Detroit, so I kind of grew up in the automobile business, um, saw it in, in its good days and, and saw it go through some really bad days. But I, I think the availability of this energy resource has, has changed, at least to some degree, the manufacturing um, outlook for, for the U.S. When you talk about companies like Nucor bringing a plant back to Louisiana because they have natural gas as a resource, or even closer to home, companies like Shell talking about building the first greenfield um, ethane cracker in, in, that's been built in North America in the last 40 years, either in Ohio or Pennsylvania or West Virginia, because of the availability of natural gas, that has a big economic impact in terms of, in terms of the real economy. You know, from, from a, a global company like Shell, from our point of view, this is, this is just an intensely interesting challenge to be able to manage. Ten years ago, we were looking at importing natural gas to our country. Uh, through LNG that might have been produced out of the Middle East in Qatar or Australia or some other or some other locale. Now we're contemplating being able to export that and how much should we export. So a great opportunity for us, an opportunity to do is, 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 as Bob said, talk with other countries and figure out how to expand this business model to other places too to allow them to have some of the same um, the same energy opportunities that we do. But in closing, I got to mention one thing too that is also real important to us. Um, this is a resource that's going to be around for a long period of time. Generally, when we get into a particular field, we don't buy and flip. When we're involved in a field, we may be producing there for 20 or 30 years. We will have families that grow up around those areas, that live in those areas, they're educated in the schools in those areas. And um, because of that, uh, from our point of view, that brings a responsibility to a company like mine. We have to develop in a sustainable way. And a sustainable way means doing the right thing by the air, the water, the footprint, and the community that you're in. And I won't say we have it all figured out right now, but we do have a set of principles, ones that we're happy to talk to anybody about that we've made public. And they should describe what we will do in a particular area and their principles that I hold myself to adhere to and we will hold our organization to adhere to as well. Thank you. Uh, well, in order to make the most of uh, the natural gas boom, I think there are six uh, points that need to be uh, taken into account. First is a, is a suite of uh, environmental issues, and I'll say the, these are focused in the U.S., but they're probably also influencing international uh, investment and international policy uh, 
concerning uh, particularly shale gas. Uh, I quickly want to say before I just quick list them, all of these issues are manageable with today's technology. We don't need any breakthrough. Uh, they are largely a, a ma matter of execution uh, and a culture of safety and uh, uh, I, I would say thorough appropriate regulation. Uh, the issues that I would highlight are uh, methane leakage, uh, and this is a, a major threat to the, the, uh, the brand of gas as a clean burning fuel. Uh, the environmental community in the U.S. has moved from strongly supportive of natural gas within, uh, five, say, five years ago to, I would say it's fair to say now, they're either silent or actually strongly critical. And a lot of that <coughs> reflects a view that the um, methane leakage uh, from uh, gas facilities uh, make the global warming potential of gas uh, equal to or greater than coal. I don't agree with that, those calculations, but uh, that's certainly a very real concern, and I think it's fair to say that we uh, could do much better in reducing the methane leakage. Air emissions from uh, concentrated uh, engines, whether they be frac engines, compressor engines, in, the, in regional uh, areas have already caused some uh, local uh, smog and other uh, conventional uh, pollution, air pollution problems. Uh, as we build in the Northeast, particularly, particularly in Pennsylvania, uh, this is something that just has to be appropriately dealt with. Uh, the issue of methane migration that's front and center in, in, uh, in uh, Demick, where now we have both the state regulatory agency and the EPA investigating, uh, is uh, one that, uh, again, needs constant uh, attention uh, by operating companies and, and regulators. Last but not least, uh, of these environmental issues would be uh, the disposal of drilling wastewater and specifically the uh, deep well injection and uh, the potential for uh, low level uh, earthquakes or small earthquakes. We saw an, an event like that in Youngstown and that led to a regulatory response and a, and a pretty deep public response. Um, other, other issues uh, that I think we uh, have an opportunity to uh, or can uh, allow us to maximize the benefit of shale gas boom is, is in transportation. You know, I, I've, I gassed up today at 379. I was using gasoline, and I think if I was in uh, Oklahoma at a Chesapeake Energy uh, uh, natural gas filling station and driving a Honda Civic or some other natural gas vehicle, it would be in closer to $1.50. I mean, there's $2 uh, per gallon that uh, has been left. Uh, shall we say, on the table or coming right out of my pocketbook and every other American's pocketbook. Uh, the, uh, n another, uh, I think, real opportunity is, uh, is the issue of exports. Now, you know, that's a two-edged sword. Uh, the Dow Chemicals of the world uh, or of the U.S. don't want it exported because they want low-priced natural gas. Producers at 250 say the price is too low and we want to export. There's going to be a tussle around that issue about what amounts to to uh, maximizing the benefit. Is it an export-led strategy or is it a domestic manufacturing strategy? Uh, and there's, there's some real tension there. Uh, last but not least, uh, I think uh, the, the uh, debate about uh, whether gas and renewables uh, are, are in contest uh, is an interesting debate, and to some extent uh, it's true. But I, I personally am bullish about both gas and renewables in the U.S. and around the world. And both gas and renewables are booming. Uh, they have been booming at the same time. I think they're going to continue to boom, uh, even without a price on carbon. Uh, I like uh, their, their, their future. California right now is at about 40 percent gas for power and 20 percent uh, renewables. And they're on course to be at about 55 percent gas and 33 percent renewables by 2020. Uh, and that move to gas is reducing the coal burn, in, at least at power plants in the U.S. Uh, and we've seen a significant decline in the amount of electricity com coming from coal, 52 percent uh, in 2000, down to 42 percent, and, and heading lower still. So I don't think it's so much a gas and renewables war uh, as perhaps a, a, a contest between uh, oil and gas, and to some extent perhaps uh, coal and gas, at least in the U.S. in the electric sector. One of the uh, difficulties of being the fourth person on this kind of all-star team is that you're inevitably going to repeat a lot of uh, 
items which have been mentioned, and uh, I will do so because it, they deserve underlining and maybe put a slightly different slant on it. The first is I agree with Russ. This is the biggest deal that has happened in U.S. energy in the last half century. The availability, the unexpected availability of economically producible natural gas throughout North America and uh, uh, also in other parts of the world. It has a tremendous impact on every aspect of energy in the economy. People have spoken about the great contribution it's made to jobs in places like Ohio and Pennsylvania that are going to be of increasing interest during the remainder of this year. Uh, it's reduced the prices. I pay half what I do for the supply of gas to heat my home than I did three years ago, and that's good for the American consumer everywhere. Uh, state report, reports been made about the contribution that this revolution is making to our national security in a very important way. Not only is it going to reduce the amount of imports that we have uh, significantly uh, compared to expectations, but it also will influence our foreign policy posture in all energy matters because we are going to be more important producers uh, in, and exporters uh, uh, in, in the future. So it is really a very important positive effect, which we normally don't have very many examples of in this country. It is good for consumers, good for the country, uh, and it is uh, thoroughly to be uh, supported. However, there are certain things that it does not do. There are certain things that this natural gas revolution does not do. First, it doesn't altogether solve energy security problems. Many of our closest allies and partners will remain dependent on imports much beyond what North America will be. Secondly, it does not solve global warming. Global warming is still an issue that has to be faced by this country and others around the globe. It reduces the effect on global warming compared to something like coal. But the fact of the matter is, even if you had all natural gas in the power sector, you would still have a contribution, unacceptable contribution to greenhouse gas emissions from CO2 that is going to cause a uh, global warming problem. Uh, so uh, the third and the one which I want to spend a bit more time on uh, problem is that there is a very real danger that public concern about the environmental impacts of uh, natural gas, uh, unconventional gas and unconventional oil production across this uh, country uh, is going to slow and perhaps even stop this tremendous economic uh, uh, opportunity. And uh, uh, Commissioner Hanger has uh, spoken about some of the specific issues that come up. But the fact of the matter is that the public is concerned about these environmental impacts and wants to have some confidence that if things are getting better over time. Now, I have uh, recently uh, chaired a group, which are, uh, I, I, I wasn't the one who made her ill, uh, but our chairman here uh, was also a member of, and we were asked by the Secretary of Energy, Secretary Chu, to identify measures that could be taken to reduce the environmental impacts of unconventional gas production. And I, I don't want to spend my time going through water quality issues, air quality issues, and community impact issues. Let me say that they are much broader and more comprehensive issues than just comes to the question about the composition of fracturing fluids. Uh, but I do want to say that it is my very strong informed judgment that neither industry nor government is doing enough to pay attention to actually reducing these environmental impacts over time. And let me say to you, we're expecting to have 100,000 plus of these wells drilled across the country, producing gas and oil at low prices, away from uh, your need to pay, pay to import this uh, oil or gas from uh, other countries. We are, we are really going to have a lot of this stuff through our bed, but if we don't have a way of dealing with these environmental problems, it's not going to happen. And I'll just mention a couple of things that are very much on my mind. Uh, there is a good deal of friction, a good deal of problems 
between the responsibilities of the federal government, the Environmental Protection Agency, and state regulators. <coughs> Even charming state regulators like those who come from Pennsylvania. But there are real issues which come from the, the uh, competing authorities on private lands from these different regulatory authorities. I believe that what the American people are looking for are a system which says we are going to do measurement of these activities Industry will do measurement of these activities for their environmental consequences, air, water, or community impacts. They will disclose those measurements, and the public will be able to see that over time, every year, the impact is being reduced. It's not going to go in one shot. There's not a way of making it perfect. But the public will see that there's a continual improvement in operations in the field and in technology so as to have a record that environmental impacts are being reduced and that is what I think is absolutely uh, necessary for, uh, uh, for, for this revolution to be properly balanced between its benefits and its costs. You know, we're here at the ARPA-E uh, annual meeting uh, and I want to just conclude about the role of technology because there's more good news uh, in this area about technology. The history of the oil and gas industry in this country is when they see a resource domestically or foreign and the opportunity to make uh, profits, which is what their business is, they work very hard on introducing better technology which makes for greater efficiency and therefore larger profits. Happily, greater efficiency means doing these operations more simply, less water usage, and of course has then a common, uh, has accompanying environmental benefits. So uh, I think there's optimism in what we should expect, what has been a relatively fast buildup of industry production practices today. Over time, it's going to make things better. The federal government does not have a sensible or an understood philosophy for what they should be doing in uh, unconventional oil and gas research and development. Let me say to you that that is a bipartisan uh, record. Neither Republican nor Democratic administrations have thought that they needed to do anything. But there are clearly a set of technical issues which are important and will not be addressed uh, uh, sensibly. Cannot, you cannot assume that industry colleagues uh, let me give you two or three examples. Induced seismicity, an issue of growing concern and, and importance, is not a subject which you would think that an, uh, an oil company is going to do basic research in. Uh, the question of methane migration and the greenhouse gas footprint of methane production now throughout the country, very important to understand what it is. There's a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of hot words, very little data. Uh, so there are a whole question of gas to liquids, moving into the transportation sector, what can be done. Uh, these are all matters which need attention on the technology side by people here at ARPA-E, uh, as well as elsewhere in the country. Thank you very much. Yeah, very, very good. Uh, I think we, we hit a lot of issues, I guess, uh, to start off. Uh, let, me, uh, let me put out one question that was raised already, and I certainly heard it. Uh, as I've interacted um, at this conference, but other conferences, particularly in the clean tech world. And that's the question, uh, is natural, is this abundant, low-cost natural gas for, and, and, and in all likelihood, uh, existent for as far as, as uh, anyone could practically plan, is, it a, is this a friend or a foe of the ambitions of the renewable energy industry? And why would you, so could you give me your opinion and, and um, explain why you have that view? Uh, maybe what well, you already yeah, started. Yeah, okay, energy, here. Yeah, this guys are actually in the, in the I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a quick crack, crack, uh, crack at it. Um, as I said, I'm actually a, a bull uh, on both uh, gas and renewables. Uh, but let me say, I think uh, the... The uh, question also needs to be refined to ask, is, it a, is uh, uh, shale gas or gas a, 
a friend or foe of low-cost uh, low uh, shale gas, a friend or foe of renewables, to, to just note that gas is not low-cost in a lot of the world. Uh, certainly in Asia and Europe, gas is, what, $10 for 1,000 cubic feet or more? That's not really low-cost. In the U.S., it's 250, <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, in my view, unsustainably low. Uh, but even at four or five dollars, it's uh, it's a very uh, competitive fuel uh, with just about any renewable technology. Uh, I think what you can say at this point is that uh, there's also very significant declines in renewables. Uh, that's one point that should be noted. The second thing you can say is that there's a lot of public support for renewables, just as John Deutsch correctly. Uh, asked the question or made the point that public support or opposition can impact gas pr production, uh, public support for renewables has created the, the fact that there's about 36 states that require uh, a certain percentage of electricity to come from renewables. About uh, over 100,000 megawatts of new renew renewables must be built in more or less the next 10 years to meet those just state standards. Uh, again, California is a, is a big example of this. Uh, they're going from 20% that they've already achieved to 30% or 33% by 2020. My state is going to 8%. Uh, Michigan is going to 10% by 2015 and is on track to do it. All these states are pretty much on, well on track to, to meet those requirements. So I actually think uh, gas uh, is going to do very well uh, in market share, uh, certainly in, in uh, power production, but also renewables will in, in the U.S. So I, I, you know, at the margins, there's certainly tension, but uh, I don't think that the marginal story is actually the, 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 where, where the, the heart of, the, of that uh, question needs to be answered. Well, let me, uh, let me just I th thank you for the clarification, because I, I certainly was referring to the U.S., um, and uh, uh, I guess the, part of the reason I ask it is, is some of the discussion we had a little earlier, which is the important, John uh, certainly emphasized this, that um, the, you know, the time frame over which this kind of major development will occur, decades, um, that the shaping of the political perspective and the forces and how those forces are brought to bear uh, is important. And uh, I think in this area, the idea that uh, if one could uh, correctly adopt a view that renewables actually benefit in the long run, maybe even in the short run, depending on circumstances, for a low, from having low price, price natural gas, that helps produce a supportive constituency as opposed to one that views that I'm going to be put out of business because gas is going to make electricity Set the, set the ceiling on, on electric prices uh, too low. So I think that was really kind of where uh, I came from. Anybody else have any comments on that? Well, I, I, I think it's always tempting to take a Pollyanna-ish view and say you can have both. But uh, think about it this way. It would be uh, really terrible if we argued that uh, we would be better off we citizens who pay gas bills would be better off if the price of gas was ten dollars per thousand cubic feet here that that would make us better off because it would make competing energy sources relatively more attractive which would include renewables for sure but would also include coal and nuclear i think that you have to start from the point of view we are blessed by this low cost fuel and then the question is Yes, there will be higher cost alternatives which are going to have uh, uh, competition that they didn't expect. And there again, technologists have the responsibility to identify opportunities to make a deal. Uh, we hear a lot, and I think it's true, of the potential of having hybrid systems now between solar central solar and coal and uh, natural gas generation which uh, might be a winning deal in a way that was not present in a high gas world so I do think that gas low cost plentiful domestic gas we should not resist the, the realization that it is competition for nuclear and which I'm very much strongly for and for renewables which I'm strongly for and we've got to manage our way through that time and find clever ways to benefit the public. 
Any other comments? Do you have no, I think the only the only other comment I'd add is is I do think you need to expand this just beyond our shores a wee bit to kind of consider the whole energy mix for the world. Um, when we do our internal our internal math on on what the energy needs will be in 2035 or 2050, which is not an unrealistic time horizon that you apply to the investments that you make today, we think the world are, is going to need everything. Um, different parts of the world are going to be more intense in one energy uh, resource versus another, but we think there is definitely space for renewables, for natural gas, for coal, uh, for, for oil products. And, and even then, we're going to be stressed to keep up with what we see as a demand function that's driven by continually growing economies and some of the powerhouse economies of, of, of South Korea, uh, Japan, or certainly China or Asia or, or, or Brazil. You name your favorite growing economy, it's going to need more energy. Um, when it comes down to the specific locales, uh, John made a good point. Uh, you know, natural gas is $2.50 here, but it's probably $10 if it's supplied, or $12 or $15, depending upon the contractual terms, if it's supplied by LNG. So you'll have different parts of the world with different gas prices. I've, um, and I think that's going to continue to drive demand one way or the other. But if you step far enough back, and it's not too far back, not unrealistically far back, the world's going to need everything that we can produce from all of the energy resources we can to have a comfortable uh, energy environment. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would like to say, can I say something here? Uh, you, you say quite correctly that currently we have three different markets for natural gas. We have Europe, it's 10 bucks. You have the U.S., it's two dollars and a half, which I celebrate, you worry about. And then you have uh, Shanghai and Tokyo and Asia where it's like 14 or 15 dollars. Uh, I will tell you that there is a very smart, capable oil company called Shell, which is in the business of doing gas to liquids to erase that kind of a differential across the globe. And I think one of the important, from foreign policy and energy security point of view, possibility is that there will no longer be 30 years from now, 20 years from now, three different markets for natural gas. There will be a single world market, will here, which here again will benefit the security interests of North America and the United States. So I, I'm not at all sure that we have an inevitability of these different uh, natural gas prices, natural gas markets around the world. The one thing, I, if I could just jump in here for one thing, um, a couple points. I think, first of all, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, as you said, I mean, we talk in the United States, President says, you know, um, we need an all of the above strategy. We need an all above the strategy around the world. Um, everybody needs to be looking at the different the different uh, components of an energy mix of what's going to work best for them. This point, too, of the dynamics in the market, the dynamics in, in the sector is really important. But one thing I would probably bring into this is that it may not work on its own. There's probably going to be a need to make sure the policies, the governments are doing the right things to sort of let these transformations take place. We've seen a number of places where governments indeed do interfere, whether it's just strict investment or in the energy sector per se. And these questions are going to be ones that are going to need to be worked out, and it's not always going to be very neat and tidy. Um, and we're going to see things, I think, too, where technologies are put in place now you don't just scrap a coal-fired power plant because natural gas got cheap. We know this. But we're seeing this in terms of China and other places where they're locking things in now. Um, and that's going to have an impact. One thing that I might come back to on this with the renewables versus the, the gas is how do you sort of try to make sure that the right things are actually locked in um, now rather than later. And again, also realizing there may be further innovations down the road. I think those are uh, good comments. It, it, it leads to a, uh, a follow-on question. Uh, and, but one comment I want to make, because I think it plays out it's, uh, somewhat uniquely in the United States, and, and, and that is, uh, for, for one thing, the, the energy system in the United States is almost entirely uh, owned by uh, private entities. It's not there as unlike it is most places. The second thing is U.S. is unique in, this, in the sense that you as individuals can actually own mineral resources. That's not commonplace. <coughs> but that has an effect. Uh, but that leads that. There is. That leads to this question. An implication uh, that John had, I think, is that the U.S. is, in fact, then likely to become an important LNG exporter, a source of LNG, although you could be GTL, but 
Uh, and what are the implications uh, of being an exporter of a commodity? One of them is that you basically internalize the global price into the United States. And I think that's one of the... And there are ramifications for that. We heard about the one with respect to the petrochemical companies, whose view... Uh, I had one uh, CEO of a petrochemical company say, gee, you know, it might be 1920 again when you had all this gas coming on from the Texas oil fields as they developed, and you had a whole industry was invented to take advantage of it. Um, if you go to LNG, does that, what happens? Do you globalize, do you basically internalize a global price for natural gas? Comments? I guess I'd, I guess I have to comment on this because we are in the LNG business, as John noted. We're, we're a big supplier around the world, and as you can expect, we'd be looking at uh, the market in North America, and not as a consumer of LNG, but a potential exporter of LNG. And um, you know, it's hard to say exactly what what LNG export from the U.S. or from Canada would, would, would do to the total to the global market. Huh? You know, there's uh, uh, some 70. Um, uh, a million tons per year that comes out of Qatar right now, and I think there's maybe 10 or 15 MTPA that are being contemplated just in the permit process, and, and right now by either FERC or Department of Energy. I'm not sure that number's right, but it's kind of directionally right. So it'll be a long time before we overtake or even come close to that supply. And, and Qatar is, you know, just one of the suppliers. Australia is a huge supplier, et cetera. Um, but we are looking at that, and I think um, what, regardless of what we decide to do in the United States, I will tell you that the government of, of British Columbia. Colombia and Canada in general is very interested in supplying LNG uh, off the coast of, um, of British Columbia to, to uh, the Asian markets uh, for the reason that they have an awful lot of gas in Canada. I mean, we talk about the shale gas developments in the U.S., and they're big, but there's equally large shale gas developments in Canada that are not next to a, a huge market like some of ours are, and there's a great economic incentive for the country to be able to export, and there's a great interest in trying to facilitate that. And companies like uh, the, the one I'm involved with, with Shell, or, or other companies are all looking at that. So we will call part of the, uh, the North American equation here in the United States, but we won't call all of it, because I think certainly um, uh, the Canadian government uh, will go a direction that they've established right now, and I see something happening in that arena in the, in the not-too-distant future. These are all big investments, number one. They take a long time to get off the ground, get built, and, and get contracted, but that will go. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate around what happens to um, our economy if we export um, relatively less expensive natural gas from the United States to a market that has a higher gas price because it's just basic economics. It, the flux is that direction. Um, but it could be a relatively small amount of what we produce right now. Could be. Um, we've, we've grown our production to the rate of about 70 um, um, uh, BCF per day, and that's what's succeeded in decreasing the prices to the point of $2.50. Some argue, some argue that it's not bad business to be able to uh, continue to stabilize the investment in the gas business by having an export, uh, an export um, opportunity to, to the rest of the world. I think uh, the last chapter is far from yet to be written on, on how that will pan out. Uh, but that's only one part of the equation. John mentioned uh, gas to liquids or, or the ability to use uh, natural gas in not only the petrochemical industry, but other manufacturing industries. I think all these things are going to be tied together. I personally think it's healthy that they are tied together. You try not to um, force fit a particular solution based on a desire to export a lot or not export anything. I think there is an economic reality here that we all need to look at uh, in the energy balance of what is becoming a world commodity. Oil has always been thought of as a world commodity, at least within my, my lifetime. Gas really had never been thought of as a, as a world commodity. Uh, it really is now, and that's happened within my lifetime, in fact, within my career uh, at Shell. So that, that's just an intensely interesting thing to look at, and I think you do, have to, you do have to let that world economy work to have a healthy balance around the world. Any other comments on that issue? Maybe this would be a, a good time uh, we can splice in. Let's take, let's take a couple of questions from the audience and, uh, and go from there. Good, we've got people lining up. Uh, please please uh, say who you are and ask your question. Uh, my name is Adam Caper. My firm is Synchrony Venture Management. I want to pick up on what Professor Deutsch talked about with the um, challenges of low or uneven pricing and uh, price differentials around the world. 
So you talked about clever solutions, but to me the elephant or maybe the donkey in the room would be some sort of tax policy at price leveling that uh, shifts, uh, that puts the externalities into the pricing uh, and also uh, sort of levels the tax base. The Saudis have been very successful at being the de facto price setters for world oil. It seems to me, and because of their inexpensive production cost, it seems to me we could be in the same position with in the global gas market, particularly if GTL takes off and, and it becomes economically feasible for things like Marcellus, in small quantities, that is. Uh, so why wouldn't we take that differential from two and a half bucks to eight or nine, whatever is a good competitive world price, and use it to fund all the infrastructure and other things that we need to do. It seems to me like a win-win-win and an elegant solution, not a clever one. Right. Any comments? Well, I mean, uh, uh, we don't uh, raise taxes in my church uh, unless absolutely necessary. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. And having been involved... So it's a religious issue, not an economic one? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But let's talk about economics. <laughs> having been involved in when we did the world windfall profits tax in the late 1970s, I will tell you that the way the money gets gathered and then distributed is a lot different than the way the economist would tell you it should happen. So I'm not keen on a kind of um, centrally directed policy measures interfering in uh, the government flows, interfering the energy flows of this thing. I understand its attractiveness as a way of gathering money to go for the purpose that you think is important, let's say. No, that wasn't what I said. What I said was it's a way to set level pricing and give us a competitive, take, use our competitive advantage in pricing to create a stable market rather than a disruptive one. So I, Windfall I, I, price taxes, that's a straw man yeah, argument. That's, not, yeah. that's a bad analogy. That, that was a uh, different just, situation. Let me, just, let me just say, having been in the Department of Energy as undersecretary, when we were trying to set prices of natural gas across the United States and gasoline as well, uh, we did a pretty lousy job of it. I'd like to take a slightly different tack on it. I, th I think that you you, you, you raised the world index. I mean, you raised you raised an interesting point. Saudis are very good at this. You raised an interesting point. Um, <laughs> but one of the one of the issues uh, that comes to mind, and it was actually a question I had, um, given that U.S. of all the major industrial uh, countries ha is unique in its gas resource base. We know what else of the economy of our size. The real question is. You could flip that over. Say, have the U.S. Uh, could the U.S. have a competitive advantage, especially with respect to, say, Europe and Japan, by having by far the lowest cost of electricity, right. and use that to drive competitiveness, um, put pressure on on European and Japanese manufacturers who can't even come close on energy prices. So, I think this issue of what pricing does to competitiveness is a, is, is a really important one because I think the U.S. is unique in its position to be able to actually pick paths in this because of its resource base. Any, any other comments on this committee? Next question. Very good question. Uh, John Sofranco, uh, Bio2 Electric in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, we've danced around a lot about gas to liquids, and so I'd like to see if the panel could have some discussion about why we haven't seen announcements, and maybe I'll answer part of that question, which is, first of all, there's a plethora of technologies one could choose. Uh, right. Many of you on the panel have them, right. Sassol, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, et cetera. It's really not a technical challenge. Right. It's a commercial challenge. It's a capital efficiency challenge. Right. But with the magnitude of what we have in front of us, we actually, from a supply-demand perspective, could build multiple units in this country thereby driving the capital efficiency challenge that we've seen in as-built units could go away. But what are the commercial challenges? Why, isn't, why haven't we seen announcements? I think I know the answer because commercially it's a lot easier for you to ship and supply at $14 a gallon than use a two in a gas to liquids. And then the, the follow-up is, is there anything the government can do to facilitate a coordinated effort in gas to liquids in a large way? Okay, so let me make sure. The question is, if we have this resource base, let's assume we're going to have it, uh, you, you didn't say what you think the long-term price is. What's your view of the long-term well, price? Well, I, I actually did strategic Because it's a long-term price. Yeah, I, I did strategic issue. planning for ARCO back in 1990 or so, and um, 
We tried not to project the price. We looked at uh, ratios and splits. And um, I'm willing to bet a fair amount that gas prices will go up. So will diesel and gasoline. And I'm willing to bet that the ratio on a dollar per ETU will, will spread more when the economy turns around. Basically because we have a shortage of refining capacity. Okay. So, so basically the question of the panel then is, where are the GTL plants? And is that, is that something that's going to happen? Well, let me put a plug in for ARPA-E. I mean, uh, I understand that ARPA-E, I believe the program guy is right here in the front, front, look, is actually going to put together a small GTL program. Mm -hmm. And their approach, as I understand it, I don't want to speak for them, is really to go towards a lower, a lower uh, size of processing, of economically efficient processing unit. Whether that is going to be successful or not, I don't, don't know. I must say that I think there are a lot of interesting options out there which have been touched, which have been explored to some degree in the past beyond just doing Fisher tropes to get to diesel from natural gas. And I actually believe that there are a lot of these uh, sinister oil companies working on this problem. And you're going to be surprised <laughs> we, because they, they are facing two and a half dollar gas, which they've bought at high prices, and they do see a, a 70 or $100, uh, and it's there for some time. So I believe you are going to see these companies come forward with different GTL Enterprises. I don't really think it's a central government role like you might argue for photovoltaics and renewables. This is right in the, the kind of thing that oil companies can do very well when, they, when they're convinced of the opportunity, both in terms of the stability of prices and in uh, what the technology will bring. So I actually think you're going to see it in GTL uh, in the United States. Okay. No yeah, I suppose I, yeah, I, I got to. I guess uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. I represent I represent the company that probably has the biggest GTL plant on the plant on the planet in, in Gutter. Who we just opened a, what we call the Pearl Plant, and it uh, out of two trains will have the capacity to produce about 140,000 barrels per day of product. Um, you, you pretty well outlined some of the economic criteria that are important to decide whether that investment's a lucrative one. Number one, it's a, it's a it's a low cost price of feedstock. In that particular area, you, I think we have 20 wells produce the, the produce the 1.6 BCF a day that go into the front of that plant. To give you a little perspective, the whole United States probably produces you know 65 or 70 BCF a day. So, you know, just just five percent or so of our total domestic production goes into the front end of that plant, and it comes from a field called the North Field, which is the biggest accumulation of natural gas that we know of on the planet. So, a very very low cost of supply to output the product, and it also brings condensate out of the ground that's entrained with the gas. So you get condensate from the gas. And then you, you split that off, take dry gas, put it through the plant, and you got product on the other end. A good economic proposition. Expensive in the sense that we had to build um, everything because there was nothing in that area. Uh, the thing that you hit, you nailed, though, is, is you do need to see the differential between where oil products are and natural gas is, not just for one year or two years or five years, but for 15 or 20 years. Um, once you build serial numbers one and two, there's two trains there. You will be looking at, we will be looking at process and, and ways to improve it. It's, it's, it's based on Fisher Trough. That's the, that's the process, but we will be looking at uh, the, uh, the, the catalysis uh, that takes place in, in the reaction to see if we can make it uh, more fit for purpose. We will also not have that island mentality that we had to have in Gutter, but take a look at how we would be able to share facilities if you were to site a plant that's close to refinery, the refinery say, that has a lot of other utilities. The one thing that hurts you on this side, though, is the gas isn't as cheap. There's a lot of it, but it's not as cheap as that gas stream, and it generally, generally does not have the liquids that come out of it that tend to make a, hell of a, a bit of an economic uplift to it. Um, but we are looking at it. Huh? I mean, it's just a compelling um, uh, uh, economic argument for us. It would be for use, in, obviously, in North America. If it was built here domestically, that would be our, our primary um, uh, mechanism to offload the product. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, we're looking at LNG. We're looking at, we're looking at GTL. We're looking at, as I mentioned before, uh, an FN cracker as well. These are all huge investments. But uh, I do think there probably is some process work that can be done. I continue to ask our people about that. You know, is there something that's new and different other than, you know, the, the standard Fisher trough that would make it even more economic. I think those are all things to explore, but you'll see something someday would be my prediction from, from someone. I mean, Shell's talked about it, Sassol's talked about it. I'd be surprised if some of our competition isn't looking at it as well. 
You know, if, if, if those who were at, uh, I don't know how many of you in the audience, but many of you, I think, were at this event last year and in the day before the uh, conference, we actually had a panel discussion about GTL. And I think that where you are on this is certainly the opportunity for invention and innovation. Um, you know, if you could reduce the capital cost per barrel of a GTL plant by a factor of two, for example, it would be all over it then. I mean, and, and you know, you say that's a lot, but you know, we're talking about lots of factors of two or more in this environment. So I think, you know, um, to some extent, the pace of this development, I, I said, I think in the news, I've seen maybe Cecil has, has already talked about maybe permitting a plant in Louisiana using their technology, but plenty of opportunity for inventors to work down that capital cost and any significant reduction in that. And uh, I think you'd be all over it. Thank you. And just a follow up case, I, I've heard a little bit about some possibly looking at lower volume. I think it's a really brilliant idea because it's kind of like isometrics. You know, if you focus on making a thousand barrels per day rather than a hundred thousand barrels a day, you have to do things totally different. You may not get to the end point, but you'll, you'll learn something that will be very well uh, applied when you go to larger scale. So. Very good. Interesting. I'll keep, we'll keep our eyes open. Thank you. Uh, next. I'm Jim Landers of the Dallas Morning News. I'm a little confused about um, how rapidly this technology is going to diffuse around the world. Um, I've talked to people in this country who say we're light years ahead of anybody else in the world. We understand this. We've done this better now than, mm -hmm. than anyone. Um, but Every single well being drilled in the Permian Basin right now incorporates um, hydraulic fracturing. Um, horizontal drilling doesn't seem to be a, a, a monopoly of ours anymore. Um, so when, when we're thinking about you know, our relative advantage against the rest of the world, how quickly is this technology going to spread to China, to Poland, to other places that have a lot of shale gas? Let me, let me take a first crack at that um, fast. Uh, a couple <laughs> things are going on right now. I think, first of all, if you look at the, some of the estimates, unconventional natural gas now accounts for over half the estimates of, of natural gas resource base worldwide. Um, it's ex expected to account for roughly like one-fifth of global gas production by 2035. We're seeing, um, as I noted, China is certainly very interested in this. India is very interested in this. Poland is trying to move with this. The questions, though, then start becoming, you know, you have a, a number of different factors, as we've sort of intimated here, that are, that are at play. You've got the geology. You know, is, is there stuff underground? And then you have the questions of infrastructure. What infrastructure is there? What can be put in place? And I would argue not just physical infrastructure, but the regulatory and financial infrastructure. These are huge financial outlays. And if you're going to put money, if a company is going to put money in a place, they're going to want to make sure they can get it out. And they're going to want to make sure that the contract is going to be followed and respected not just tomorrow, but two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now. So that rule of law piece is really important in what's going on. But there is a very strong interest in this technology in other countries and in picking this up. Uh, we're seeing this in the International Energy Agency. has been doing a lot of work on this front. There's a conference actually next week in Warsaw that they're, uh, that they're setting up to look at um, the sort of what kind of rules are necessary uh, to sort of help this technology to be adapted uh, more generally worldwide. Again, I want to come back to your earlier point. It may not be for everybody. I mean, there are some countries that have come in and talked to us about, gee, we think we've got shale, we think we might want to do this, and we're going, okay, but what about your water supplies? You know, there are deserts out there. Um, you, you know, these are the sorts of things that need to be taken into account and need to be looked at um, as, a, as a country moves to develop on these sorts of things. So again, it, there's a lot of different pieces going on, but the technology is something that is attractive to a lot of governments out there and to a lot of companies, I think, around uh, the world. Let me, let me comment. Thank you for the, for the question, because I think it, it reflects perhaps something that is not as well understood uh, in general as, as understood in the industry. Um, when one thinks about the development of a natural resource, there's much more to it than a piece of technology. It, it is an integrated set of processes and experiences and regulation and financial structure and project management and all of these things. If you don't put them together well, you have an uneconomic performance. 
I think a lot of people think that as well, if you can, you know, it's, it's not like software. It's not like something that can be duplicated perfectly. And of course, this is the historical business of the international majors. They go to resources, they help countries ultimately develop the internal intellectual experience, financial structure, everything else that is needed to continue to develop the resource base. But at the beginning, it isn't that way. So uh, the existence of major oil field service companies, companies that have made a living, like Schlumberger and Halliburton, companies like this have made a living because what they translate isn't just the technology, they translate know-how. And that's a crucial aspect of resource development, and I think that's the reason why the U.S. continues to maintain a very superior position in this area is because they've developed the compass. Does that not mean that China won't develop it? No, for certainly it doesn't. But nonetheless, the ability to go to a resource and develop it in the most cost-efficient way and in the most environmentally responsible way will continue to be an organizational capability beyond the technology. Anybody else have any? Okay, good question though. Uh, but I, I think you will see it's a propagation of a business model and a supply chain and a technology all wrapped yeah. around. And I think that's part, part of it. Yes, next question. Thank you. David Hagen, Fast Power Systems. I'd like to follow up on that gas to liquids issue. You mentioned the uh, Middle East program you had. And explore what are the most effective ways to get us to transport fuels? And what are the barriers to those? The current statistics are that the available net exports of liquid crude oil are already declined 13% from 2005. Jeff Brown and Sam Fouché at the ASPO.USA. And that's after the internal consumption of the oil exporting countries and after China and India. So that trend is to zero in 19 years, and we import half our fuel here in the U.S. That's current statistics and trends. The question China is now manufacturing methanol from coal. It has maybe the second largest uh, coal resources in the world. The U.S. has maybe the largest, or China's second or third. So they're taking their largest resource, putting it into liquid fuels, and rapidly putting it into methanol vehicles. They're now purpose-built methanol vehicles in China to take methanol from coal. But they're now having to compete with the, meth with the methanol that's now being made in the Middle East, similar to your gasoline. Methanol is less expensive, cheaper to make, uh, more efficient to make, than going to gasoline or diesel. It's currently the equivalent cost of about $2.68 a gallon uh, on the international market. But What's being made is instead gasoline or diesel, that has to be, that's higher cost, less efficient. But the problem being, we don't have the, the vehicles to switch back and forth easily between methanol and ethanol and uh, gasoline, yet the technology exists for that. Mm -hmm. The biggest barrier to that variation between easily to switch from methanol to gasoline and back again is the Environmental Protection Agency. It's regulations preventing the conversion of vehicles to the alternate, the flex fuel technology that already exists and has been proven back in the 80s. So that's a train of issues, one from the cost of pr producing the methanol most efficiently. The other major transformation is the technology. You were saying, what about small methanol, gas to methanol? Well, the Brookhaven National Labs had major investments, hundreds of patents, those have been bought up by Oxford Fuel, and together they're commercializing a methanol, a gas to methanol, in something that's a couple of trucks load size instead of a factory that's as big as this room, or ten times this room. So that technology is not about to go into commercial production. Those are the major issues ahead of us. How do we deal with them? John? Well, I, I, I mean, I must say that uh, uh, there's certain circumstances where the first part of your question really becomes very, very sharp. If you look at uh, natural gas production in Western Africa, uh, offshore West Africa, you might say there's a choice there. Do I bring that energy to the U.S. as an LNG product, or do I convert it to methanol at some floating uh, power, uh, floating plant, and then bring it as methanol to the United States. 
And then uh, I actually believe that that engineering calculation off of West Africa, not off of Qatar maybe, but off of West Africa, probably is a pretty much, pretty much of a, a, a real push, very close, even at lower methanol prices that are today. And then you can say, well, don't take that far bridge of putting it into a, a methanol car. You could just put that methanol into a power turbine. Absolutely. So you're now competing a power turbine fueled on methanol versus a power turbine Absolutely. fueled on natural gas. And I would guess it's a pretty uh, close, close thing. It depends upon the circumstances. <coughs> uh, the Russians, for example, which have oodles and oodles of natural gas, might find that a very, way, a very good way to do electricity production. Uh, in Russia. So I think it's a very, very interesting question to which all these bright young, I, I find that hurtful, all these bright young uh, ARPA, uh, yeah. like our, our wordies are going are, are to make progress on this. But there's no reason you shouldn't fall in love with a molecule. Methanol may be a better way to go. Uh, you know, I guess my comment on this is this: these are the kind of things you're going to see happen as this... Right. Resource space is developed out. There's going to be variability. There are going to be, uh, I think, the diversification, the evolution of that diversification in the U.S. energy system is good things. And so they, this will evolve its way around. What we don't have in the United States is a central energy management system. I mean, we don't. And, and, and so, you know, uh, uh, this is something about what I think we might see is the ability, to, I think where you're going is, don't restrict the opportunity for niches to emerge, whether somebody wants to do it or not. California had, of course, the methanol program, you know, as you recall, many years back, that did not turn out very well. But on the other hand, uh, the world's different today. And so I think uh, ultimately the question for policymakers is, don't restrict the options for using this uh, this ubiquitous low-cost molecule. And, and would, they, would you agree with that that's where we need to go? You're not going to mandate. I don't know why I would go as far as, as the same thing, tell the government mandate all vehicles use all fuels. I'm not, that, I don't know if I'd buy that. But actually, that's a $125 conversion cost, and we're spending thousands of dollars each year per family because of the higher cost of oil, because I do not have the option to go next door and use methanol or ethanol. Well, so I say if, sure. if you had the opportunities to develop this and people could buy vehicles to do it, then you would develop that. I don't think that's the same as mandating that all, fu all vehicles use all fuels. That's a different... And the EPA currently is cost charging $10,000 for you to prove that you can convert this vehicle when it only costs a few hundred dollars to convert it. Uh, but the other is methanol used to be made in the U.S., when the price went up, the manufacturing went down to Chile and New Zealand. Right. Now, the com companies are now reopening the methanol plants in, in the U.S. to make use of the natural gas. Uh, one question, I, one, one statement I would make, when you said that the U.S. imports half its fuel, uh, actually the U.S. has become a material diesel exporter. Three Only million barrels a day, the U.S. actually has now become... A major, we import three million barrels of oil to turn it into product and export it. So, just to clarify that, that's produced fuel, not global oil. We you, we import half of our oh, total global yeah. oil. Okay. A small portion of produced well, fuel. A little less than we're half. Exporting. A little less than half. But we export now three million barrels of that imported oil goes back out as yes. product. That's what's called manufacturing industries. So that's part of one of the changes. Yeah. My name is Bob Loudon. I'm from the Missouri University of Science and Technology. Rolla, Missouri used to be University of Missouri Rolla. I hear a lot about the nat my question has been partially answered already, but I hear a lot about the natural gas boom in the United States and North America, but I've not heard a lot about it internationally, globally. My question is what other nations are poised to also jump and this has come about primarily because of horizontal drilling and shale gas. What other nations are likely to be major players in the future? And when this gas boom goes international, is it likely to drive the price of gas down even more? Is this likely to be something that's going to happen when the rest of the world catches up to the United States? Well, I need to comment. This is Shell's business. Right? 
Yeah, so if you just want to take a look at particular countries, I think... I Particularly think China and China, Russia, for example. Absolutely. Yeah, China, China has China. probably has the geology. And Bob points out one of the, one of the key ingredients, though, is, is getting, a, getting an infrastructure built around with it to get the right. gas from where it is to the place that can use it, huh? But, I mean, we're involved in a couple of 8,000 square kilometer blocks with CNPC. So, you know, the, the, there's an intense interest there to, to bring another fuel source in. I think um, you'll see Australia. I think you'll see Eastern Europe. Everybody's, everybody's got their opinion on, on, on the capacity, the geologic capacity. Let me just say it that way, of Poland and the Ukraine and other areas. But there's an enormous interest for all the reasons that you might speculate on, energy security, you know, the economy, et cetera, to, to, to bring gas to bear there. And then some parts of Afri Africa, particularly the southern part of Africa, they're just behind in terms of the, the uh, not behind. Um, yeah, yeah, John. John actually stole my thunder. I was getting there, but South America has 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 a huge amount. Uh, I was going to say Colombia. He reminds me of Argentina as well. That have that have tight reservoirs uh, to be commercialized, right? To be proven. Right. These things, you know, we kind of think of these as already discovered resources. To some degree, they are, but whether or not they can be economically extracted, uh, uh, given the position they might be in and the logistics that need to be built is still sometimes yet to be determined, but there's an awful lot of uh, energy, pardon the pun, going into going into looking at all those areas that I've talked about from it, a it number of companies. Without getting into a, a, a brief lecture on petroleum geology, I mean, the key point is here, uh, when I was a young explorer in the Gulf of Mexico, we used to call these the source rocks. Right. These are the rocks where the hydrocarbons were originally generated and then expelled and trapped. And that's what we've been developing pretty much until this point in time. The key thing to keep in mind is the source rocks are 100 times more prevalent than the reservoirs. So that's what makes this really interesting. And any place that has produced petroleum in any volume or coal in any volume has methane in these yeah. kinds of rocks. It just turns out that the U.S. has... As yeah, the no, world, I understand. The U.S. has the best source rock system in North America. Technology is but in the U.S., but I'm concerned that there may Eastern be. Eastern Europe. I mean, it's a good concern that when this goes global, that it, there's a lot of gas that could change the entire global uh, gas situation. And that's, that's, thank that's, you. that's good. Good for. And I think that's the expectation. Right. Sir. Good afternoon. Dave McCarthy. Uh, great discussion on bringing gas into transportation. I wanted to bring up a, an old pathway, hydrogen and fuel cells. Sure. Um, the most efficient way, I believe, to get natural gas wells to wheels into transportation is through the hydrogen fuel cell. Do we see a renewed push into some of the technology development that's needed, hydrogen storage, fuel cells, infrastructure? I haven't heard too much about it this week, but a little bit. <laughs> well, well, I would say Larry true. Burns was on it. Those who went to the transportation panel yesterday talked a bit about that, in fact, as he's become quite a convert. Uh, natural gas reforming is, is by far the most efficient way to produce hydrogen in, in any significant volume. But anybody have any comment? <laughs> well, it just strikes me this is another case. There's these molecules, you're going to have so many of them. I, I think this is, a, this is an inventor's opportunity. How do you use this molecule? And then, you know, certainly it's, a, it's the most efficient carrier of uh, hydrogen. So, good, good question. Sir? I'm Bob Pollack, and I have a question for you. Uh, of, over the last year or so, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about using natural gas as is in long, -term, in long trip uh, trucks. Uh, been, pook, been, been put, whatever. Uh, He's been, uh, he's been pushing it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. More recently, we've heard other stories or other reports about use of natural gas as such in uh, diesel locomotives. Uh, how real are these? Uh, are these just things that are good to say on, on the 6 o'clock news? I, I think they're very real. I mean, I think you bring up uh, using natural gas and transport. We've talked about converting natural gas into a methanol and using it that way. There's another leg to that story, though. The, the previous question was on hydrogen. I mean, right. uh, that, that, that's one source. The other one is just compressing it or turning it into LNG and using it in an engine. I think, you know, I've told a lot well, of people if you, this. If you compress it, you're going to have to put in heavy, heavy weight, uh, uh, heavy pressure, uh, uh, 
Yeah. Oh yeah. Few yeah. things. But uh, is that going to create? Is that going to be a disincentive for it, or? I, or no, I think the incentive. Personally, I think the incentive is there. I mean, we happen to be going down the LNG path, where you'd have a very small plant that would convert gas to liquefied natural gas. In fact, we've got a project in Canada right now where we've hooked an LNG plant to the back end of a 60-year-old, 60-year-old gas processing plant to convert that gas to liquefied natural gas, and we're selling along a corridor from Edmonton uh, straight down to north of Calgary and then west, you know, through through a number of retail stations, primarily for what you talked about, which is heavy-duty truck fleet, huh? Not not vehicles like you and I drive, but heavy-duty truck fleet. Uh, I, uh, you know, well, the differential, in, the differential, if you believe, if, if we owned an 18-wheeler fleet, you and me, and we believed in the long term that there's going to be $100 oil and $2.50 gas, it probably pays to convert your engine and it probably pays to run it on LNG over the long term. But it's a nascent market, huh? It's just beginning. And if I was going to do that, I'd want to make darn sure that if I'm driving south of Edmonton in January at 2 in the morning, I'm not going to be sitting in 20 below weather. If just looking around for a, looking around for a station, I've got to be able to make sure the supplies there. That's one. I think the other application that you have is a marine application, too. The big diesels that, that run boats, uh, for example, up and down the Mississippi River, where, where it's you know pretty easy to find fuel sources along that path where they could refuel, refuel their, their tanks, their, their vessels if they were converted to uh, natural gas. Much cleaner burning, and there's a, there's a big interest in uh, some, of the, uh, some of the carriers that move up and down the, uh, the Mississippi. We're working with Wurzela right now in converting some of their, their boats that way, and we use them as supply boats. And that, that's a good thing. A, a, a colleague of mine back at the office says, milk men should drink milk. So if you produce if you produce the natural gas, you ought to figure out ways to use it in your operation. Where that comes home to me is using it in the big engines that power our drilling rigs. So I think you've hit on a very key area that's going to be uh, the, applied to transport. How about the uh, how about the railway engines? Maybe let me. Is the same thing true there? One of the key points, if you're talking about compressed natural gas, which has been around for quite a while. In fact, those who visit Calgary, Canada, most of the taxis run compressed natural gas. Part of the challenge of compressed natural gas beyond uh, larger vehicles, and you see them on the municipal buses all the time, okay, you see that storage thing on the top. The challenge is if you compress natural gas to 3600 PSI, which is standard storage, it still only has one quarter of the energy density of gasoline. That's a serious issue because that means the amount of energy you actually carry on board, therefore the mileage, is a factor. Now, it's not a factor for a city bus. It's not a factor for delivery vehicle or trucks. It is a factor. Now, LNG will fix that, but that's another level of technology compared to compressing gas. It's passenger cars, especially as people drive to smaller vehicles for higher mileage. So I think you can have, figure how is this going to sort itself through the infrastructure. But I think that uh, most, and this is a disagreement on the panel, like most people agree it's going to find its way into a number of high-value applications, particularly fleet applications. I mean, 25% 20, of new transit buses now are, are rolling out, are running on CNG. Perfect. And that ought to be. And uh, just about it, uh, waste management is just about buying every single <laughs> yeah. new uh, waste truck running on CNG. Not quite, but uh, close to it. Uh, so there's already some examples of transportation markets where natural gas is, is a major player, even a dominant player. Uh, any fleet uh, vehicle right at this point where you bring a, bring a set of uh, trucks or other vehicles back to a, mm -hmm. a central location, uh, the, the economics are pretty compelling, uh, and, unless you really believe we're going back to $10 a gallon, uh, $10 an MCF natural gas, and I don't think anybody believes that. Almost every major automaker makes a compressed natural gas vehicle that you can buy. We've got about 10 minutes to go, um, and so what I was going to suggest, we take the three questions here, and then we go through the panel and say, any final thoughts? So, Good afternoon. Uh, Daniel Harrington from Duke University. Uh, with the U.S. leading the way in producing shale gas, it seems like it's our responsibility to do it in an environmentally friendly manner. Uh, do you feel like the rest of the world will follow suit, and, or will some of those poor environmental practices or good environmental practices be dropped off along the way as they expand to other countries? Good question. 
Well, I, I think uh, the U.S. still has to meet the challenge that uh, John Deutsch put very sharply in his introductory remarks. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of people in the U.S. who don't buy that this has been done uh, operationally safely and operationally excellently. Uh, and it's never going to be done perfectly. Uh, but uh, there are a set of issues where I think uh, the performance is suboptimal, uh, environmental issues. I mean, methane leakage, methane migration, spills and leaks, all of these things are not our real suboptimal performance when you're talking about the U.S. gas industry as a whole. Uh, and you, again, you have companies that uh, uh, are at superior performance, and you, you're, it's a bit of a bell curve, to tell the truth. You know, there's very good performance, and uh, there's also uh, at the other end of the curve. So, uh, and I think this has been, you know, I know for a fact that when we had gas migration in Dimmick, Pennsylvania, that was an international story. Uh, I was in, personally interviewed by the uh, BBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, not too surprisingly, Vladimir Putin's uh, media outlet, uh, made sure they were all through Dimmock and into Harrisburg to, to try to uh, create the impression that shale gas could not be produced uh, safely. So uh, I, I personally think both within the U.S. and around the world, this issue of environmental performance and the brand, what I call the brand integrity of gas, is still very much up for grabs. Any other comments on that? I, I just one thing I guess I would add about this that that's I'm, that's I'm always a believer that when the numbers get big, other things begin to be a factor. And John mentioned 100,000 wells anyway. Uh, that's a lot of wells. The one thing about shale gas development, it is a sort of subsurface manufacturing-like activity, more so than traditional oil and gas. And that means there's going to be a lot of things happen. That means that if there is a shortfall in practices, it's going to materialize because you're going to drill enough wells until you have a problem. Um, so I think that's one of the things to keep in mind. And, and the other implication of it is, especially in areas that are in which oil and gas hasn't been part of the culture for a long time. I mean, it was in Pennsylvania a long time ago. It's been a while since Drake's well in 1860. Um, you're industrializing the countryside. And that is taken, I think, to how people react to that, I think, affects, uh, affects this issue, too, politically. And that'll be true internationally. Yeah. True Next internationally. Hello. In, in, uh, in the US and in North Dakota, we're right. going on shale gas. Right. I'm either asked to pull Linden, professor of energy at IIT. My question, I, I agree with the, that we need much more R&D in order to make it safe. Just drilling, the, it's really what happened recently, this fracturing has been around for a long time. It's a directional fracturing, which really makes it much more economical. My question is that, and it seems from the, what the panel worried or the, the, the rest of the people in the area worried that other countries is going to, to explore that and explore natural gas and there will be plenty of natural gas. So nobody talks about the bubble of natural gas anymore. They talk about the much more long term and sustainable. Mm -hmm. I want to ask the opinion of the panel, is it time that we really look at sustainable natural gas and pick these molecules as the molecules for transportation, as the molecules that we put energy from one place to the other and put much more research and development in the areas to come. For example, I haven't heard anybody talk about hydrates, natural gas hydrates, which is tremendous amount of natural gas in the form of hydrates. Yeah. I wanted some opinion of the panel about that. Is the question about the, uh, the panel's view about hydrates as an additional Additional long-term yeah, natural for, gas. For those in the audience that, that aren't familiar with this, I mean, this is a form of natural gas which is bound with, and under the right pressure and temperature conditions, it gets bound with water into an ice light. Uh, the resource base of this is enormous, just vast, even compared perhaps even to shale gas. But any comments about how hydrates fit? John? We certainly ought to be exploring hydrates, but if you think that the environmental problems are uh, manageable or whatever we want to characterize them now with respect to uh, hydraulic uh, unconventional 
gas or gas and oil. The hydrate issue is going to, I think, present much more difficult uh, uh, yeah. environmental issues, So, which we haven't touched. I mean, we have nobody, I don't think, really gone into it. I mean, looking at them coming out of the tundra and, and Alaska and the like. But uh, you are right, it is another huge resource for, of a resource base of, uh, of methane uh, around the world. But again, I want to stress, we're going to have to do a better job, a better custodial and production job if we're going to be able to use this batch of methane, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you for your question. Final question from the audience, and we'll wrap up. Kirsten Hagforce from Duke University. Um, kind of building off Daniel's question about safety, I'm interested in how companies like Shell can distinguish yourself in the marketplace for taking on the additional expenses of having really safe practices and what kind of opportunities you see to drive market demand with um, educating them on your, your investment. Well, you distinguish yourself by doing what John said. You're at, the, you're at the right end of that bell curve in terms of the way you're viewed as managing the resource, both from a, a sustainability standpoint with respect to the environment and, and a personal safety and a process safety standpoint. Huh? You get fewer people hurt. Zero. We have a slogan, goal zero. That's always what we try for. You have no acid integrity issues with the kit that you manage on the surface, and you conduct yourselves in the proper, in the proper manner. Now, I, I will tell you, I mean, I, I have an absolute passion to try to combine getting the resource out with getting it out the right way. And I think, um, uh, it, as John mentioned earlier, it, it, it doesn't take technological breakthroughs to be able to do that right now. It takes good, sound operating practices. I'm not afraid of regulation at all if it's the properly placed regulation. In fact, I'm happy to work with regulators to try to tell them what we think the biggest issues are and have the debate. It doesn't necessarily mean we'll agree on everything, but generally we'll come up with a better answer than either of us would have come up with independently when we do that. Um, uh, so, so regulation's fine. Don't mind regulation. Prefer it just be from one entity rather than regulation coming in from all different sizes, sides that's, that's constantly changing. That does not make the business environment easy to function. And so there's gives and takes on both sides, but it's an it should be absolute table stakes to operate to make sure that you can do things in an environmentally responsible way. I think we will get better over time, too. I think if, you, if we think, as an industry, that we have all the answers right now, we're, we're making a mistake. Um, uh, the panel discussed uh, 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 greenhouse gas emissions, methane emissions, call them what you want. Are we, as an industry, very conscious of what that level of emission is to the point that we can prove to the public, we can prove to an NGO that natural gas is at the lowest possible um, emission and it's even be and it's better better than coal? I don't think we can prove that yet. I think you have to be involved in real science around that issue, not hysteria, not calling each other names, but let's put some real science to figuring out from, from, from uh, wellhead to burner tip, what is the loss of methane along that whole line with some real measurement. I think one of the NGOs that uh, uh, is involved in that, EDF, the Environmental Defense Fund, is a, a beginning project on that that several industry players, including Shell, will be involved with to try to put some science to that issue. And we will learn from that. And we will learn how to do better. And I think that's just incumbent upon all of us to have to do that the right way. You distinguish yourself by your own performance. Nothing more, nothing less. If it's not good, you shouldn't be operating. Well, let's uh, thank you very much for the question. Let's wrap up. Uh, maybe take one minute each. Final thought, starting with you, John. It's John Hager. No. It's <laughs> final thought. Well, I have actually two final thoughts. Right. One is... Uh, um, Russ, I would uh, stress the importance of measurement and putting that measurement on the table because no amount of eloquence is going to substitute for having numbers out there, and that so far has not happened. And the second thought I have is, boy, we've heard a lot of different ideas here today. And the important point is not that we know or can guess or uh, which one's going to work, but the fact is that a lot of new things are going to happen and that makes it a very interesting area to be working in, but also a very interesting area for RPE. So I say we're going to see a lot of different things happening here, which we can't predict, of course, with any accuracy now. On uh, the public acceptance, uh, I think, uh, yeah, measurement's important, transparency is important, but actually I don't think it's enough, at least in the U.S., at least in the no northeast uh, part of the U.S. <laughs> I, I think the... Uh, the suspicion at this point, uh, rightly or wrongly, is so uh, significant 
that uh, it's going to take uh, some kind of independent verification process. And I, I frankly am working with a number of NGOs and companies, uh, including Shell, uh, on, on that kind of initiative. So uh, I think, I think uh, that's actually going to be an important uh, test of both the environmental community and, uh, and uh, uh, others to see if we can come up with a credible process that works uh, and helps move uh, this, this uh, industry and this resource forward so that it can be produced in a sustainable way, in a way that actually most Americans and, and potentially most people around the world accept. So I, I maybe finish with what I what I started with. I think this is in, in my in my career anyway one one of the most uh, exciting times to be involved in, in in the energy business because of of the resource that we have the opportunity to take advantage of. It's a bounty that comes along kind of once once in a lifetime, and it has to be done right. But when you think of the possibilities that it opens up for for everyone, from the consumer to to people uh, like this audience is primarily comprised of uh, uh, ARPA or or independent independent entrepreneurs that have a real technological uh, angle to their to their uh, line of business. This is a fantastic opportunity for all of us. So um, I'll work hard. I know you'll work hard to make the very most of it because uh, that's what uh, that's really what we all deserve. Thanks for being here too. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I sort of agree with everything everyone said ahead ahead of me here, which is actually a nice position to be in. But I think one thing I would add is come back to this point. The dis the uh, growth of gas, and particularly what unconventional gas means, is a huge boost for U.S. energy security. This is really helping us. There is great interest in this around the world. But I also want to come back to the point, I think it's also sort of come out, we're at the beginning of the story. We've done a lot in the U.S. People are looking at what we're doing. We all know we're not at the end. We know there's a lot of innovations yet to be coming, how the applications work, how the regs work, how all this stuff comes together. And so I think this really is. And this is, this is an exciting time. Um, there's a lot we can do in government, but it's a lot more than what you can do in science, what you can do in industry, and how this all comes together. So it's uh, really a great time. Well, I'll just wrap up. Thank you all for coming. Um, I said one final thought. Maybe it is, really is 1920 again. Maybe the U.S. has reset its whole resource base. Think about what that did then. Think about what it can do now. Thank you. <laughs>